Wonderful. So uh, really glad to see everybody here. Welcome uh, to uh, the Linux Foundation Public Health, uh, our uh, online event for November. Uh, and uh, we are really excited to have our, our newest member presenting uh, today. This is uh, going to be a presentation from a company called Health Vanna. They have been working uh, in public health for a long while, uh, going back well before COVID, and I'll let them go into the whole history of that. But I think what's been really impressive is how they've managed to take all of their learnings from that, pivot it into the COVID space, and come out with some, it's, it's a very, their, their approach to how they've been handling COVID credentials and how they've been looking at patient data has been very pragmatic. It's been very patient centric. Uh, a lot of talk about how, here's what we're seeing people actually doing. Here are the actual problems on the ground. It's not theory um, and it's not, it's not vaporware. It's, uh, it's real experience. They've delivered over, I think it's 25 million COVID credentials, whether it's test results or vaccination records to people around the US, um, which has been really remarkable. And uh, I am really uh, happy to, to introduce Raman Bastani here, uh, who will be leading the presentation. Uh, just before we jump in, a quick reminder, uh, as with all LFPH events, uh, that this is being uh, governed by our antitrust policy. So uh, note that this meeting is recorded. Uh, anything that you say here is considered public information uh, and that if, uh, and as well as the, the LFPH code of conduct. So I'll be dropping those links in the chat uh, in case you need to review them. Uh, and with that, uh, I am thrilled to pass it off to Roman. Thank you for having me. We're big fans of the work you all do cool. and we will jump right in. One other thing, Ron, while you're getting your while you're getting your slides up, uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that we do have the Q and A feature open. So if you have questions, please do drop them in the Q and A. You can also upvote other people's questions if you have them. Um, but please do use that feature, uh, and we'll we'll have Raman do his presentation, and then we'll definitely have time at the end for Q and A. So with that, over to Rob. That sounds great. Uh, hello, everyone. So uh, the talk is, the title is something you all know. It's how to empower patients uh, with their COVID information digitally to help uh, amplify the great work public health is generally doing to help with the response and the outreach. Like Jenny said, we've helped uh, 25 million plus records get to patients across 20 states in the US with COVID. And we expanded our platform from working a lot in other parts of underserved populations, including in HIV, uh, and lots of other health related conditions. Um, so we've been doing this work for a while. Uh, the first part of the screenshot was just to show you what it looks like when someone gets an Apple wallet um, version of their vaccination record with all three doses. And this was tweeted a couple of days ago. So we like to generally show things that are happening in real time. And that was one example. So uh, what is Healthvana? Uh, Healthvana is a HIPAA compliant patient communication platform. And it's used by healthcare providers to manage, uh, engage and communicate with their populations. Uh, there, uh, you know, there's, I guess, three main things to think about us generally uh, is what we serve for COVID is the last mile. What I mean by that is how you engage patients in their health. How do you get information to people in a way that's actionable, that's actually helpful to you? So for COVID, what that's meant is we have been the last mile in delivering COVID-19 test results across the United States. Um, we don't have a complicated portal. I'll show, I'll show you what it looks like in a minute. We have a very easy way that you can access your information that tells you what to do next if you're positive, if you're negative, and you have the ability to put that information in your Apple wallet. Everything we do has um, the mindset of making it feel more like Instagram and less like Windows 95. We think a lot of health and technology looks really antiquated, and that turns off a lot of patients and populations from wanting to engage in their health. We have a really good idea of how to do that kind of work. And that's what we've been able to expand into COVID-19. So we call ourselves a lot of times the last mile. That includes the delivery of test results and other health information and being able also to target text messages, reminders, that means for things like booster shots. Uh, and we really have focused on priority populations for a long time now. And we have delivered prior to our COVID work, tens of millions of last mile type information to patients across the country as well, whether it's for chronic conditions, um, for prophylactic medications and all sorts of other types of uh, work that we've done. So uh, 
this slide is meant to talk about credibility. We've been featured in a lot of media uh, over the last couple of years, and especially during the COVID time. Uh, and we've also presented our work um, previously at the White House, at the National Library of Medicine, a lot of universities, and a lot of great events uh, like this one. Um, we have a good sense of what we're doing. And the point of this presentation, I think, is to share what we've done and how it's impacted um, some of the public health organizations we've worked with to see if there's insights um, that may be useful to you all. wrong page. Sorry about that. We'll get it back on in a second. Give me one second to stop sharing and then I'll come right back. So maybe while that's reloading, Raman, I think that um, you know one question that's already come up has been, uh, you know, how have how have the how have you worked with public health authorities to actually figure out the policy that goes with the tech? So hopefully you'll answer that, but we'll uh, cover that question later on too. Yeah, give me one second. I will come right back to that. Wouldn't be a good webinar without a technical difficulty. You know, we've been on Zoom for so long, and yet I think all of us still have these moments. Um, we, we did we did the check ahead of time, all all the all that, but we'll get there. All right. Assuming you can see this now. It's great. Okay, great. Uh, so what we were going into is a lot of what we talk about with public health officials is that they are facing an unbelievable amount, an unlimited amount of public health challenges with generally limited staff resources. And so a lot of what we end up doing is helping amplify uh, the great work that incredible public health people are doing. But a lot of times they're restricted by being able to use and restrained by using old technology to communicate with their constituents, with their populations, whether that's a city, a county, a state. And so a lot of what we've been able to do is help make that a lot easier to amplify the great work that public health people are doing. And I'll give you a couple examples of what that looks like. But for this particular use case, what we're gonna do is Los Angeles County. And so we've done a lot of work with them for COVID-19. Some of the challenges they initially engaged in were, they're, they're big, right? They're bigger than actually 40 different states and are uh, in the country. Um, they have uh, a large geography they're looking at. There's 88 cities within Los Angeles County. So there's a lot of communication challenges that come along with that. Um, they have multiple different labs they're working with. There's lots of different um, stakeholders in public health. Um, and they end up hearing from a lot of patients just because there's so many different people working on it. So a lot of what Health Bonnet was able to do in Los Angeles is help deliver almost all the COVID-19 test results that happen at large stadiums and everything else earlier on in the pandemic. In addition to that, we were helping with digital contact tracing, where the contact tracers generally are doing an incredible job, but with the digital contact tracing, they can notify people within minutes as opposed to waiting a couple of days. Um, and I'll go into what that looks like as well in a second. We've also been able to deliver a lot of vaccination records that helped with when um, they're asking people to show vaccination records to go into different venues. And there's been a lot of targeted messaging. So if all of a sudden you're allowed to do um, Pfizer shots for as a booster for people that are 65 and older, we're also able to and have actually sent out that kind of messaging. And then also we're doing a lot of patient support. So instead of public health having to answer a lot of phone calls and emails that are coming from uh, the community, we're actually doing all of that patient support um, where we're asked to do. And we're able to do that in um, a lot of different languages. So this is what the experience looks like uh, from a patient's perspective. So you'll get a text message and or email. And so we get the data that's upstream from us. In this case, it's a test result. We're getting it from whatever lab we're integrated with by way of the direction of the public health agency that we're working with. And you can tell it's just really brief. It's simple. Um, you're seeing the information wherever you signed up. And if you were to click on the link, um, you would be able to then put in your first name, last name, your date of birth to verify your identity. And just to be super clear, this is all on the mobile web. This is not an app. You don't have to download anything. It's not complicated. And within about 10 seconds, you'll have access to your actual 
test result or your information. And as you can tell here, this does look a lot more like Instagram than it does Windows 95 type systems. And then you have the options to add it to your Apple wallet or into your Google Pay wallet. And the idea there is people want convenience and security and accessing their information. This certainly helps them do something along those lines. Uh, here's what the integrations look like once you put it into these different types of wallets that are digital. And I mentioned the patient support before, but it's worth going over again. Uh, we've answered probably 2 million different inquiries over the last 18 months. Um, and we generally get back to people on one, maybe two business days. And so we're really good at communicating people with uh, in the language they prefer. And a lot of the issues we're seeing is that people might mistype their information. Their date of birth may be flipped around because their you know, phone is set to internationalization. So there's a lot of different things that we've seen that we kind of have a good sense of how to address. But the key thing here is that you get information to patients in a way they want. And as you improve uh, the contact information for that patient, you're able to then send them additional targeted messaging about, hey, it's been six months since you've been vaccinated, potentially you want a booster. So there's a lot of advantages of being able to correct that bad data equals bad communication thing we talk a lot about as a company. Some of the outcomes that are worth sharing is that on average, from the moment we get it from the lab uh, for the COVID-19 test results delivery specifically, it's taking patients about 15 minutes to view their information, not get access to it, but actually view it. That helps tremendously with people knowing their status if positive or negative, if they have to go, go into an event, go into a hospital, get on a plane, whatever it is they have to do. And on average, we're seeing about 97% of people uh, view their test results within 24 hours. So we know we're getting to people, whether they are um, in, in all sorts of different ways. And you can also use um, a computer at home if you don't have a smartphone to be able to do that. So there's a lot of different ways to access this as long as your information is internet enabled. Uh, the staff efficiency, this really goes back to what we're helping public health departments with and has been a big boon for LA County in that example I shared earlier. They're saving a lot of time um, and not having to get back to patients. When we first got asked by LA to jump in and help during COVID, it was, I think, April of 2020. And um, they were making 50 hours of phone calls a day trying to get information to patients for their test results. And they were using paramedics and firefighters, and they were doing the very best they could. When we jumped in to help within about a week or two, um, I think it was down to almost uh, no, call, no calls happening because of this kind of uh, delivery outcomes we've had. This is also another part of how we've been able to help public health, uh, specifically in LA um, and in other areas, is digital contact tracing. Normally, it's taking contact tracers, and they're great, and this isn't meant to replace them anyway, but it's taking them several days to get to the first person who's positive, and then it's taking them a couple more days to follow up with any contacts that come after that. What digital contact tracing does is it adds the ability for every single patient who tests positive that we're delivering the information for to anonymously and instantly add someone's phone number or email, and then that person will receive the exposure and notification right away, telling them that someone in their network has tested positive, and then giving them access to you know, free testing options in their area. So we've seen this have a huge impact in the areas we've been able to do this. And here are some of the outcomes we saw early on when we started measuring them. What we noticed was that time was reduced from several days down to less than an hour, generally in minutes that people were able to notify others. People were providing more contacts because it felt more secure on their phone to do so as opposed to waiting for a phone call in some cases. Three quarters of the people that were using the feature actually came from communities of color. And on average, the person who was being notified that they were exposed, um, they were viewing that message within two minutes. So we know this has had a big impact. And if there are public health departments looking to deploy this at a statewide level, countywide level, this is one of the easiest things to implement if we're the ones delivering the actual test results in a municipality. You can add the um, additional feature on top of delivering information to people who have tested positive. The next piece is just to show you what the digital vaccination records look like. As you can imagine, they look similar to the test results. And we are really proud and we have an unbelievable team, an incredible team that's able to quickly iterate and uh, update things in terms of whatever is happening in the pandemic. And so what we were able to do is in December of 2020, launch the first digital vaccination record in an Apple wallet, which you'll see on the far left. Uh, we then worked with Google to launch um, their first version of a vaccination record in their wallet a few months later. And this is the preference we see a lot of people wanting is to have easy and convenient access to their information so it's easy to pull up. And there's also lots of mandates across the country in different ways. What we're seeing is different venues um, utilizing and showing Healthvana on their homepage saying this is one way to show your information. And just to be super clear, 
in no way do we think this is a passport. Um, we've been on the record of saying that for a long time now. We view this as people's health information governed by HIPAA, which means number one, they have a right to a copy of it. Number two, they have a right to modify that to make sure it correctly and uh, accurately represents their information, whether it's their date of birth and name. So uh, we believe this is the same as getting your cholesterol results. You have access to it if you want. If you don't want it, that's fine too. And if you choose to share it, that's also your choice. Um, but we're seeing people utilize it. And we've delivered well over 10 million uh, digital vaccination records as well. Um, and these are a couple of examples of how patients uh, talk about us as well on Twitter. This person was quite excited. Um, so you see people actually posting their information because they're excited about it. And that spreads goodwill, I think, and hopefully helps with hesitancy in some cases where we're seeing different communities post about their information. The other part that has been really helpful is the targeted reminders uh, for the public health agencies we work with. And so I mentioned a little bit earlier, you're able to take the data that you have, segment it out, and then do notifications based on that information. So when J&J, &J, for example, had its pause a few months back, uh, we were able to work with um, our county partners and then within about a day and a half, send a notification to you know, hundreds of thousands of people, letting them know what to know of what just happened. So it's the people that you know have already had a J&J &J shot, you can message them directly. And I believe about 90% of people viewed that message. And surprisingly, what we just got back were a bunch of thank yous. And again, we're the conduit of the information on behalf of the public health partners. So we're just the pipes delivering the information in a way that's more modern. Um, and so that's all kudos to the public health departments we've worked with that are utilizing these tools to really engage their populations. And I think what is a glimpse of what 21st century public health genuinely looks like is this ability to engage your population in a real time way that's delivering information, especially when there's so much misinformation and confusion on who can get boosters, who can't do what. We see a really good positive version uh, of this in a way to start building better trust. And we've sent a lot of these types of notifications, I think is this last one, just to show whatever that message is that the public health department is looking to send out. And our tagline is think patient. Jenny said this at the beginning, but everything we do is very much about helping the patient uh, get access to their information because we know that has really good impacts for community health and it hopefully reduces the work on the public health partners as well. So that's what I've got. Oh, they're mute off. Uh, wonderful. So I think maybe let, let's start just, you know, with that question that came up at the beginning, right? How is it like, so, so a lot of the stuff that you've talked about here actually has policy decisions underlining it, right? It's not just a, here's the tech and we can deploy it, but it's, you know, things like there, you know, one of the things that was on your slide was that, um, you know, somebody from medical staff maybe needs to uh, or was, was that on the slide of, of contacting the patient uh, from the doctor's office prior to getting test results from you uh, if it's positive? Um, but like, how do, I guess one, was that, did I see that correctly? And two, like, how do you work with, the, with, the, with your customers around policy decisions? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure the example you're referring to, but um, it's at the customer's discretion. We know states have different ways of doing things. We know different counties in different parts of the country are handling things different ways. A lot of times what we hear is that public health departments are tasked with operationalizing what the science is being told to them by a state level at a federal level. And so what we're doing is helping deploy that information to constituents to hopefully reduce the burden on public health departments. No public health department wants to receive hundreds of thousands of requests for vaccination records or corrections to a vaccination record and beyond. And so it really is up to the public health department how they wanna end up deploying this, whether it's at a city, county or state level. And we've been successful in doing that um, with really large populations. Yeah, and, and I did get clarification from the question asker that the piece about whether or not a medical provider contacts the, uh, the patient prior to uh, them getting their results is is not was, was not something that was in, was in your presentation uh, or implied by your presentation, but was something they were thinking about. Um, wonderful. And uh, the second question is around uh, exposure notification, where it's just clarifying that what you're talking about is really collecting contacts from um, from a potentially exposed contacts from the index case. It's not a 
proximity notification tool like uh, the exposure notification APIs or, or the Herald app or anything of that sort. Yeah, we are not uh, in any way dealing with Bluetooth. We're not dealing with what we think in some cases is over-engineered solutions, incredibly well-intentioned that just didn't have as much of an impact as we were all hoping for. This is giving power over to the patient to say, I've tested positive. You have the option, obviously screenshot it and then share it with whoever you want. That's one option that people can do. You can just tell people, of course, but this is an option to do it anonymously by just entering a phone number and email. And so two things happen. One, that person's information you enter instantly gets notification that someone has tested positive and been confirmed. So the other person instantly knows that they've been exposed and they can self-isolate and they can do whatever it is they're supposed to do, get tested. In one case, we worked with the county to actually help deliver um, lab uh, tests to the person's home if they so chose. So we're seeing different ways of using this that are pretty exciting and really giving access to people um, that don't have access to healthcare in some cases. We also have an API that will have all of that information that the great work the contact tracers are doing can access to also see it. We also have a dashboard to be able to show you if there were a thousand people tested that day, who's tested positive, it'll filter that out. And then you can see of those who have tested positive, who have actually viewed that they've tested positive to help prioritize who you contact. Some of that comes from our work and working in HIV and STIs for a number of years where they wanted to notify, you know, figure out who to call first. You wanna prioritize who doesn't know first, if you're able to, it will save an exorbitant amount of time. But what we know is that patients really love having that self-service model to notify people anonymous, anonymously, especially in the school setting, because they don't want anyone to know that their kid had COVID. Um, so it's something that people can do and we've seen a really good success around it. Yeah, and I think that, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that the, the exposure notification apps I think are trying to solve a different problem in many ways than what you're trying to solve uh, with your contact notification tool. Uh, and so it's not necessarily about the effectiveness of each of them, but uh, effectiveness of the problem that they're trying to solve in particular. Uh, but I think that that's also, that, that's a really interesting point that you bring up of how do you integrate those digital tools to triage and prioritize what your, your manual contact tracing team is doing, right? Because I think and as we go into another surge now, as, we, as we're seeing cases on the rise, unfortunately, uh, I think that that's one of the things I'm hearing a lot from public health authorities is they've had to figure, you know, as the, the handling the staffing issues around every time cases ramp up and then they come down um, means that you're, there's going to be times where the staffing gets tight. And so being able to say during those times that you're prioritizing the people who need your who need to access a person to talk to and get guidance the most um, is a really important piece of that. And I guess I'd add on, or I'd add another question to that also, which is, have you seen any? Um, have there been any efforts around identifying uh, or correlating this with social determinants of health and health equity? Uh, or and is there any way to do that and and to also further increase putting your resources in the most important places? Uh, they can be for the problems that the public health department is looking to solve. It depends on how they want to go about it. What we know is everyone is slammed. Everyone's looking for solutions that will help reduce the burden while increasing public health. And like you had said, there are surges and they come back down and we're all hoping this thing is going to be over sooner than later. Um, what we're seeing that's happening generally, Jenny, is this is helping build a relationship, a direct relationship from a public health department to hundreds of thousands, millions, possibly tens of millions of people in a way that's real time, that's coming to their phones and is truncating information where it's like, here's this much information you can read and you can click a link to go more. It's not a ton of information, for example. So it's in digestible chunks that are really important to make information actionable, especially on mobile phones. And so that's what we're really good at a company of do, um, is doing and have been doing for years is to number one, get a patient's attention. Number two, um, help them take whatever that next action step is. In a dream case scenario, Every patient who tests positive would also be able to click on a link and use a telehealth version, whether it's a telephone or a video visit, we would send them reminders every couple of days, hey, how are you feeling and capture that information. But we also understand that this is not our decision. This is us working on behalf of our partners to do what they believe is best for their populations because we don't pretend to know. We just know what we can help deploy and then it's up to them to utilize it in the way they know best. Yeah, and, and I think that's a great segue also into, so Richard had, had two questions here. Uh, one was, um, 
you know, in terms of, right, so you talked a lot about LA County. Uh, is, is it the LA Department of Health specifically that's your customer or is it the county itself? Like, how does that, and, and you know, who, who within the government are you usually working with as your customer? Yeah, it's a great question. So in the LA County example, um, we were working with the city of Los Angeles first, um, then the county of Department of Health Services, and then the Department of Public Health. Uh, so we're working with a lot of folks. And as we know, in public health and everywhere, people are just jumping from one place to another and working on multiple projects at once. Um, so our relationship is with the county. And we thought that was a good example just because of their size. Um, and it's, it's helpful as an indication. We're working across a lot of states. Um, but that's one that is just really big and illustrates how they've been able to do this with a lot of people. Um, and I think there was a question about who actually pays. It's the counties, the patients never pay for something like this. Uh, we also have relationships with labs across the United States. The labs are then working with public health departments and or states or skilled nursing facilities, universities, whatever it may be. They bring us on to be the quote unquote last mile as we talk about. So we rely upon the information we receive upstream from us, which is my way of saying with COVID-19, we're not doing the registration portion. We're getting whatever information comes from the lab information management system, if it's test results. It could also be an immunization registry if it's for the vaccination records. Then we send out that information. Um, and then if people's information is incorrect, we can help get it right and then feed it back so you have more accurate information in the future. Yeah, and I think that's, that's another thing that we've been hearing a lot from various health authorities is how do you close that feedback loop around the data? Uh, whether it's a case investigator who finds out that some of the information that was in there is incorrect, or if it is a, um, or or if it's you know through 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 whatever systems uh, they find an updated record, making sure, uh, especially you know if you can get that back all the way into the master patient index, uh, those kinds of data corrections can be really valuable not only in the immediate term but in the long term. Um, and. You know, I think, uh, oh, this is a great question actually from Andreas, which is um, how do you get patients to trust your communications, right? We've seen this over and over again of people not answering the phone when the contact tracer calls or thinking that the test result that they got is spam. Uh, and so they ignore the text message. Like how do you handle uh, the idea of, of establishing trust there? It's a great question. Um, this is going to reflect back on what an incredible team we have who care deeply about helping people. And we've thought through these situations for years. Um, so there's a lot, we have a kind of a playbook. Um, part of it is if we're working with a new municipality, you start to do interviews, uh, local on local television, you do print, you do online, you do social media related work. You do quite a bit of work to make sure that everyone who can possibly know about what you're doing has that information. When you send out the text messages, for example, one simple example is a lot of times we get texts from long codes, which is just a regular phone number with the IR code. I get that spam every day from politicians actually. Um, but if you get it from a short code, which is the five digits, that means that's registered and that's more trustworthy in a lot of ways. So people will get those notifications from us. They'll look it up. They might go to the county health department, city health department's website if they Google it and they'll see that we actually have a relationship there. So um, as LA County is the example, again, that we were using, there's plenty of you know, photos or you know, screenshots of what Health Vana looks like on the county health site. And if you look at our Twitter page, um, we are incredibly active on social media, on Twitter and Facebook, especially when people message like, hey, what is this? I don't trust this, is this spam? Which we saw early on, we addressed it immediately. Um, I'm talking about within an hour, within minutes, because we knew how important it was and how quickly social media can amplify something good or bad. And so we would do that. So I'd encourage anyone to look at our Twitter feed. It's just Healthvana. And you'll see thousands and thousands of messages of what's happening and how people are responding and how people are messaging us. We even see in communities of color, people you know, putting you know, uh, all sorts of indications like, hey, I got this thing, is it real? And then you'll see like 50 comments going about it. Um, and then there's other parts of our playbook, which may include billboards and zip codes that have low vaccination rates, for example. So that's something we've also done where we put the Apple wallet or the Google wallet up there, which is something people recognize and understand. And in some cases, if you take the data we have from the uh, COVID-19 testing and you mash that up with the testing or the data from the vaccination records, what you have is you can see people are getting tested who may not have been vaccinated. So you can start to send messaging that says very clearly, you've tested negative, you may wanna get a vaccination, here's where you can go. Or you've tested positive, here's how to notify others. So there's different actionable items we can do depending on what um, our customers, our partners, 
believe is best for their particular community uh, to help with public health. That's that's really yeah. I, I mean, I think that that's 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 a huge testament to the amount of work um, that that's having to go into making this this all happen. And so then, are you also seeing a lot of that? You know, you talked earlier about all of that customer support sort of service that you're having to provide to go with this, right? Explaining what these are, helping people understand next steps, correcting data inconsistencies, all of those things. Um, is that also, are you seeing that happening on social media? Like, how do you handle, you know, I mean, all of a sudden now we're getting maybe into the area, could be patient data, probably not Twitter friendly. Uh, I don't think Twitter is HIPAA compliant last I checked, but um, how do, you, how do you handle that kind of situation and, and where are you seeing that kind of traffic come in? It's an incredibly important question. Um, we've, uh, it's helpful to give you some background here. We've um, done a lot of our work around HIV, which is the most sensitive protected health information by way of HIPAA in the country. And we have large, uh, we've probably done the most amount of work and delivery of information related to that. So we think a lot about privacy, health, um, HIPAA, and make sh making sure the data is secure in whatever ways we can. Uh, no. Twitter is not a great place to start doing customer support. What we will do is say, thank you so much. Let's move this to do a, a DM to see if we can help off of the public facing place. But we'll generally be pointing them back to our contact us page. A lot of people don't have confidence that if they call or message their public health department, they're going to hear back from someone in any kind of time. If we're that face of it, what's happening is we're getting back to people really quickly. And you'll see people actually tweeting like, when you said we'd get back to you right away, I didn't realize it'd be minutes. So then what we see is more people start to reach out and feel comfortable reaching out because they are hearing. And again, we're just a reflection of what's happening at the public health department that's tasked us to do this work as a contractor. But we realize a lot of this happens on social media. So to answer your question more specifically and directly, we generally point them back to our contact us page. But we also hear, Jenny, from people that are in really urgent times that are like, hey, look, I can't get to work unless I have X. Can you help? I have to get on a plane. I'm at the airport. I want to do this. And the pandemic feels a little less urgent for some parts of the country now, but we remember a time when we were receiving tens of thousands of messages a day of people who were saying like, I'm about to go to the hospital. What do I do? Do I have COVID? And we aren't the lab, just to be super clear. We deliver what information we receive from a lab. And a lot of municipalities are using us to help um, organize. And uh, let's say there's six labs that you're using for testing capacity. They would funnel all into health vana so it was one patient experience one patient support channel and then we were able to kind of handle all of that um so we we are really conscious of getting back to people as soon as possible however they reach out to us that's awesome um and you know so so that that that's handling all the lab data uh we got a couple of questions both from i think uh Curran and 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 one other person who asked about self-reporting uh, as we're seeing self-reporting infrastructure, you know, at-home tests increasing, uh, do you also enable self-reporting and why, why not? Sure. Are you, are you referring to testing, like an antigen test at home that you're yeah, doing? Yeah, at-home test. Yeah, we've stayed away from that um, as a company, but mostly because our public health partners haven't asked us to help with it. It's, it's a really challenging thing. We know the CDC is trying to deal with how do you do an antigen test at home and then prove it out. So Almost all of the data we're receiving, whether it's a lab result or a vaccination record, is coming directly from the source of the information, meaning the public health partner. So it's almost untouched and it's coming directly to you. So we haven't done the self-reporting for uh, test results. Got it. Uh, and I think maybe on, on a similar note, right, because, uh, you know, the challenge with self-reporting and, and, and is one of those challenges is related to uh, fraud, you know, uh, or however you want to phrase it, of, of the patient uh, misindicating their test results. Um, and then also on your uh, vaccination records, you know, Richard points out that pretty much it, it's the name and date of birth and it's a static uh, document. Uh, how are you thinking about fraud and forgery? Where, where does that fall on your priority stack? Uh, it depends on the public health partners we're working with and how important it is to them. Uh, so we started off, I think part of this question is about the QR code. Um, we started our work in December of 2020 being the first to do the vaccination records, for example. The goal is to get people their information. So they'll also know when they were vaccinated and then there'll also be a time for whenever they wanna get a booster. If there is a booster available, they'll know. Um, we have the QR code takes you to a static health on a page that just tells you where the information is coming from. So it's unlike the smart health card, for example, 
uh, that will actually do some sort of verification if you use it in a different way. Uh, we haven't seen many people scanning thus far, uh, generally from what we've heard on that. But again, it's going to be up to our public health partners. If they want that for their state, um, they can utilize that. But we still view this very much as your, this is your health information. You have access to it if you want. And here it is. Um, and then we would help you correct it if it's incorrect. We won't correct things like what day you got your dose or what dose you got. We'll correct things like my name is misspelled. It's Jennifer, not Jenny. Or my date of birth is flipped around and they can provide information to help with that. It's again up to the public health department up to what levels we can do what. Makes a ton of sense. Um, and we are, we are almost out of time. So I think with that, if people do want to um, you know, hear more about this, follow up with you, what's the best way for them to get in contact? Uh, they can just send us a message at uh, Raman at Healthvana, if that's the simplest way. I think uh, Gabriella, who's great and on this call, also provided uh, her information. You all can reach out to us however you want, um, even if it's just to kind of understand how we've done things. We're happy to share everything we've learned uh, over the last year and a half, uh, if that's helpful to anyone. Wonderful. And I just uh, dropped, dropped uh, Gabriella had shared, shared that contact info with me, so I just dropped it in the, uh, in the chat as well. Um, and then, yeah, and, and Gabriella is also on the LFPH Slack, which is always a great place to continue these conversations. Uh, I invite everybody to join us there and, and, and uh, chime in with your thoughts. Uh, and with that, thank you uh, so much to everybody who attended today. Thank you uh, to uh, Raman for presenting uh, and sharing so many of the things that you've learned, uh, really doing uh, an amazing amount of work and accomplishing so much in, in a crisis and, and on short time in a, a relatively short time. Uh, and with that, uh, we will uh, see you all. We will see you all next time at our next event. Thank you so much. Have a great day.